everybody. Uh, once again, not sure what's going on, but yeah. Okay, cool. We're good. So um, let's go ahead and begin with worship. Um, I um, hope you guys were able to see the um, find the bulletin underneath. We're going to begin with worship now with uh, a song, Come Thou Fount. It's so cool. I keep hearing texts from you guys, so thank you all for um, for uh, responding in that way. But let's do Come Thou Fount. A little bit of home worship this morning, kind of like we did um, way back when. Actually, leave that handy. I'm going to reference that later. Mm. Yeah, great. Okay, so uh, welcome again to our dining room uh, for worship. This is, again, uh, not ideal. It's not what we um, would necessarily uh, choose for this morning. Uh, nevertheless, uh, here we are. Um, and so uh, it, it's a joy to, to welcome you guys into my living room <laughs> or my dining room as we, as we worship. I have a couple announcements to make. Um, I thank you all for um, praying for the meeting I had last Tuesday at Living Stones. Uh, the, the, the texts I got um, in reference to that was really appreciated. I felt the prayers. It was a wonderful conversation um, with them as we were planning and thinking through um, ways that Grace Hill can be more than um, a tenant to Living Stones, but can actually come alongside them in the ministry that they're doing. Uh, had some great ideas, um, you know, ways to support financially uh, families um, um, who, are, who are paying to go there. Uh, some of the other needs they've had this year because of COVID and having to switch everything. Uh, well, to go have a much more uh, online presence and just some of the other challenges there with Chromebooks and whatnot. Um, so that's that's another way. But then also um, just in 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 the in the school itself, uh, some things that we could be doing. So a lot of ideas. We haven't decided on on exactly what next steps are. I just wanted to give you all the update that it was a good conversation. Uh, we've got some some ideas of way to to, to move forward. Um, and, and just wanted to let you know that and please just keep be on the lookout for things as we decide on them and what to do 
um, we'll keep you updated on that. Um, next announcement I do want to make uh, is coming from the um, bookkeeper at Christ Church. Um, just as a reminder, and I, I bear responsibility here for not making this more explicit. Since we are not our own church, particular church, um, our funding and whenever people are writing checks to support Grace Hill actually has to go through Christ Church. So um, if you could, if you if you are supporting Grace Hill um, through a check, please make the check out to Christ Church and then put in the memo line Grace Hill so it can be um, just handled correctly and also that that money gets to where it needs to go uh, through the proper channel. So again, checks made out to Christ Church, put on the memo line Grace Hill um, so that we can support this ministry. But nevertheless, just again, want to thank you all for your support. And just to remind again that if, if um, when we meet in person, there's an in-person option, you can mail it to Christ Church or online giving as well. And I just want to remind and just say this, that giving of our resources is in itself an act of worship. Uh, it's, a, it's an expression of your trust in the Lord to be providing for you. And so I just want to encourage you all again to, to give um, in the variety of ways that we're offering. Also, I mentioned last week uh, so just some things that I'm wanting to plan to do as a, as a church body, some fun things to do together um, safely and cheaply as well, uh, to, to keep that in mind. Um, and just we, we, I've gotten some good ideas, uh, snowshoeing. Uh, there's a World of Winter Festival downtown, uh, just some things to do downtown. Uh, it's just some, some fun activities that the, that the city has put together. And so... Um, cool idea. And of course, just sledding, you know, um, go, going somewhere to a good hill um, and sledding. So be on the lookout next few weeks. We'll, we'll get something in, in, in order. But uh, thank you all for the for the ideas that you've sent me. Um, two other things. I know this is a lot of announcements, but just there's a lot going on. Um, if you could, please send me an email if you are interested in being part of the new members class or the small group that we're going to be launching um, later on this month. It would be helpful for me as I'm working through numbers and figures and uh, just kind of figuring this stuff out if I had a better sense of who's interested. And so uh, text me, email me, my, my phone number, my email is all at the, the back page, the last page of the bulletin, and just let me know, hey, we're interested in... Uh, the new members, uh, the small group, um, they will not be happening on the same night. So just let you know that it's not necessarily an either or, um, but just want to let you know that we have those things coming up uh, later this month. And it would be helpful in planning if I just have an idea of, of what are the numbers I'm, I'm uh, going to have. Lastly, and I would say most importantly, um, concerning prayer requests, uh, please um, let me know, submit them via text through email, a ways that we can be praying for you. I try to do my best to keep up with uh, meeting and seeing you all and catching up with you guys on Sundays and just texting. Because um, again, COVID, it's hard to get everyone together a lot, but Please let me know uh, how I can be praying for you. Ken and I still weekly get together and even pray for you all. And um, I would love to just know of ways that we can be praying more specifically, more intently about things that are going on. And if you want, you can be as specific or as vague as you want. That's fine. But just to know that, um, to know that we'll be praying for you with that. Um, that was a lot of announcements. But let's let's go ahead and. and um, and move on to this call to worship from Psalm 100, and, uh, and then we will return to singing. So Janae is going to come and lead you all in this call to worship. Join me in this um, responsive call to worship from Psalm 100. Shout with joy to the Lord. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Know that the Lord is God. He yes. made us, and we yes. are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation.
is kind of cool to be singing in here again. Hey guys. Prefer to be in in We in prefer person, to be in person with still you. Still kind of cool. But it brings so back memories. Page one and then that. No, that's no, just that's one. Page. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, there are so many things um, to be thankful for. There are so many things to be praying for. Uh, and, and there are many things that are competing for our attention and our devotion. Um, I ask, Father, that you calm those hearts that are unsettled. I include myself in that category. I need your presence. We need your, your presence, your soothing presence, your comforting presence. Unite us in your name. Unite us in your love. And by your spirit, though we are separated Physically, we are united. We are your church. We thank you for this technology that I struggle with. <laughs> but I, I, I thank you that it is this way, this, this medium, that we can uh, join together and worship you. Thank you for making yourself known to us. Thank you for coming and dwelling among us to live the lives that we were unable and unwilling to live. And then you died the death that we deserved. But in rising again, we have a living hope, as Peter has told us. We have a living hope. Father, I know some of the needs within the body. I know that there are so many more, so many hurting, so many uh, anxious hearts, unsure of what's going to come tomorrow. 
at the same time, I know that there are so many things to be thankful for and exciting things and, and wonderful uh, reasons to rejoice and praise you. You know all of these um, realities that we're facing. But again, you, you, it's more than merely knowing. It is bringing to be bringing into being you are working in them and and again because of your purposes you are uh, causing them for your good purposes jesus thank you for coming to this earth thank you for uh, your word that we can uh, study this morning uh, and in it we find this prayer that points us towards you. It defines how we ought to live, how we ought to pray. It reminds us of your goodness. So here now, as we, your people, pray this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. About 20 years ago, I went to see uh, a f uh, one of my favorite musicians, favorite artists, uh, her name is Gillian Welch, and her writing partner, performing partner, David Rawlings. And I saw them at this really uh, kind of classic theater in southwestern Virginia. And for their encore, uh, they stepped in front of the microphone to sing to us. The whole concert had been behind a mic, as you normally see at a concert. But their last song on the evening they stepped in front of the microphone um, and they, they sang Long Black Veil. I don't know if you know that song, but that, that's the one they, they did. But it was, it was, I've never seen another artist do that, to step in front of a microphone to, to play. No amplification, it was just their voices, just their guitars. And it was as if a spell was broken or a, 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 a wall came down that they were now in our midst playing performing singing um and it was this it was this magical moment now i feel like a lot of times we we think of uh, the lord speaking to us through um, prophets speaking uh, in, in different ways even creation showing his grandeur and his creative power but there is something about stepping in front of that microphone, so to speak, and walking among the people. And that's what Jesus did. He walked among us. And his ministry does something within us. There is a response of joy, but then also sorrow. Because it is through realizing and recognizing and, and just basking in his sacrifice that we really come to grips with our sin that what it took to have our sins paid for to have our sins forgiven to step in front of the microphone in that way and so what we do weekly is freely confess our sins because we know that we're not condemned by them and it truly is because of jesus because of the gospel confession can be a uh, a joyful thing because all that we carry because of our sin and the shame and the guilt it, it is uh, burdensome but we are called to just turn them over to him to cast them upon him and to now freely confess our sins and so that's what we're going to do right now hearing this call from isaiah 53 um, I'll, I'll lead us and then you simply respond it's a it's a very quick <laughs> call but it's so so powerful we all like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way 
That is the human condition. That we, we are born walking this way. The Lord calls us and still that, that remaining sin nature uh, is drawing us back, turning our own way. That's why we confess. So let's now read this prayer of confession together, followed by a time of, of individual prayer, and then we will hear this wonderful news of a pardon. So um, read with me, pray with me this prayer from the Valley of Vision. O Lord, no day of our lives have passed that has not proved us guilty in your sight. Prayers have been uttered from a prayerless heart. Praise has been often praiseless sound. Our best services are filthy rags. Blessed Jesus, let us find a hiding place in your wounds. Though unrighteousness weighs us down to hell, your righteousness exalts us to your throne. All things in us call for our rejection. All things in you plead our acceptance. Give us perpetual brokenheartedness. Keep us always clinging to your cross. Flood every moment of our lives with descending grace. Assure us of forgiveness for your tender mercy's sake. Now let's now go to him confessing our personal sins. Amen. Hear now these wonderful words, also from Isaiah chapter 54. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For the Maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. I believe this is something that we should read every morning. <laughs> uh, getting out of bed, beginning the day, let us begin our day as we continue our worship with these tremendous words. The maker of all things is our husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is our Redeemer. Let's now stand and sing to this wonderful Redeemer, the song Anchor. Let's put that one to the side so I don't get confused.
Okay, let's now continue in worship as we um, turn to his word. And um, we are moving into the, what is the last, Janae, what's the, not the last, but the pentul, pen, penultimate, penultimate, the second to the last um, uh, sermon uh, in the series of First Peter. And what a joy it's been uh, to walk through this. A uh, tremendous letter with you guys. Um, but we're moving into chapter 5. And uh, you might see just by glancing at the passage that Peter is talking to the elders of the church. Remember, he's writing to a series of churches in what we now call Turkey. And here at the end of the letter, he is now addressing the leaders. A couple comments here at the beginning. First of all, please don't now... Uh, zone out because uh, this is a passage directed to the elders um, as if you're thinking well what uh, how does this apply to me uh, as as we'll unpack this this definitely has a lot to do with you I mean, this is this is a this is a message that is for everyone and it's directed at the elders but it's in that exhortation that we find out more about our own needs and I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in just a moment. So that's the first thing that please, this is for everyone. Secondly, um, I don't, I, I don't want to just launch into this discussion on elders presuming or assuming that everyone knows what I'm talking about. I was not raised in the Presbyterian Church. I was raised in the Methodist Church, and when I uh, came into the Presbyterian Church about 15 or 16 years ago. Um, I, I wasn't used to the term elder. In Methodist Church, we, I was used to the term bishop, and now we're talking elders. And though it comes from the same Greek word, I wasn't really sure exactly what it meant. And so just as, as a brief introduction, I, or just a, a, a statement here, I want to at least acknowledge that I'm not just assuming you know what an elder is. When we look at Scripture, um, and especially Paul's letter to Timothy and Titus, we, we see, and even obviously here, First Peter 5, um, we see the classification of, of a couple offices within the church. We have elders, we have deacons. I'm not going to go into a whole discussion of the differences and what's the difference between a ruling elder and teaching elder. I'm going to save that for the membership class. So if I could just do a shameless plug for the membership class, we'll go into a lot more detail about, um, about the, the, the different offices. But just simply speaking, an elder is one who is set apart for the work of ministry at, the, at a local church. And uh, the term Presbyterian comes from uh, this, this Greek word for elder. Um, and so it, it is, um, I, yeah, a lot more to talk about here. But um, what we're going to see is um, a very brief, I guess, succinct comment uh, that Peter has for the elders. But there is so much in there. Um, that we need that we need to address we need to talk about so enough of like a, a intro let's go ahead and, and read the passage it's four verses so so don't blink um, four verses uh, beginning at um, the beginning of first uh, Peter 5 and then we'll, we'll we'll jump in so here's what Peter says so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Uh, Father, perhaps uh, more this morning than usual, as we address a text, I, I stand humbled uh, by what, what, is, what is the calling. Uh, I pray that we hear what it is truly that you have to say uh, to us 
And I pray that through that message, we see how this applies to all of us, and not just the leadership of, in a church, but this applies to all of us. So show us um, and lead us into your uh, green pastures. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I am not a, um, I'm not a car guy. I, I can't go out and just fix stuff on my car. I can put gas in it, so that's cool. I can check the oil, and I can drive it pretty well, um, but I'm not a car guy. So I have to go to other places so they can work on my car. And recently, uh, last time I was in getting an oil change, which I think was about six and a half years ago, maybe seven years ago. I think you're supposed to do it every 12 years. That was a joke. Um, but when the last time I was at, at the oil changing place, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at all these uh, posters and advertisements that they have up outlining all the, all the stuff that they can do for my car. And while I was sitting there, I was learning about the needs of my car by observing the services, by observing all the things that they uh, offer, that they provide. I'm learning about my car. Like, evidently, um, there is a uh, differential fluid that needs to be changed. There is uh, radiator flushings that take place occasionally, um, and a serpentine belt, though I had heard of that before. Um, but all these things, I'm learning about my car um, by looking at what, you know, the, these services that are, that are offered. I think that might be a picture of what we're seeing in this passage, in that we're, we're looking at the, the, the services, the, the, the calling of the, the elders of a church. And it's through their calling that we learn some of uh, the things that we need as the flock of God, as the people of God. We discover really our needs, uh, what our hearts need um, by studying, by listening to the call of our shepherds, call of our elders. I hope that makes sense. So again, just because he's directing this passage to the elders, this is for all of us. There's all there's something that we can all learn about ourselves and our needs by studying this passage. And what Peter does is in four quick verses, he outlines the basis of what he's going to be talking about, uh, the foundation for it. He then talks about how it's expressed practically within the church. Uh, how these elders are to function. And then lastly, he, he and I love this, how he, how he does this, there's this, he concludes with motion, right? There's this ongoing, forward-looking uh, way that he concludes his passage. So when, you're, when, you're, when you finish it, there's still that kind of forward. We're looking ahead to glory. So there's a, a basis, there's an expression, and then there's that ultimate motivation for it. So let's go ahead and just and look at this. Verse 1, very simply, Peter says, so I exhort the elders among you. The word exhort is not a word we use a whole lot. Um, it's one that he's used a couple times, but basically mean it's a, it's a strong urging. It is um, uh, this, it even almost has like a, a warning side to it. Like be careful that you don't do this and be careful that you do this, um, this, this exhortation. So he's exhorting the elders as a fellow elder, right, which is important, and a witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's to be revealed. So much there for his basis, that of what he's saying here. He is a fellow elder, a witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's to be revealed. So right from the beginning, what we need to see is a humility in our elders, as, as something that we need. As the people of God, we need humility. Peter is expressing his humility. He is coming to the elders as one of them. He's not speaking down to them. He is speaking beside them, on the same level of them. He could have come in throwing his weight around. He could have come in saying, listen, man, I, I was part of the inner circle. 
I was on the Mount of Transfiguration. I, I was nicknamed the Rock. Like, you need to listen to what it is that I have to say. And Peter doesn't do that. He comes to them as a fellow elder, and we, we see this beautiful expression of his humility. So the first thing that we see in this passage that we, the people of God, need from our elders is humility. Follow-up question of that, where does that humility come from, and how can we discover that from this one verse? Where does the humility come from? It comes from being captivated and captured by two things. The suffering of Christ as he calls himself a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And it also comes from the hope and the glory that's to be revealed. And not just a hope and the glory as sort of an emotion, but he even says as one who will partake in the glory that's to be revealed. Peter is looking backwards at the cross and he's looking forwards. And we need our elders to be doing the same. We need our elders to be so taken by so captured by both the glory, uh, the future glory, as well as the, the cross, the sufferings of Christ. There are some things, if we continue with that a little bit more specifically, that, that we need to see. When we look back to the cross, we see a love that was expressed to the death of Christ. We're looking forward to the time when all the sad things will come untrue, like we've said before. The day in which Jesus will come in his glory and all the sadness all the sickness, all the coronaviruses, all the division, all the fear, all the tears, all that will be wiped away. We're looking ahead to that, and we're looking back to the cross. Our brokenness, our sin, our need for a Savior. And again, we need elders to come in and remind us of our brokenness, while also pointing us to that restoration, the redemption that we have, the inheritance that we have that is undefiled, that is unfading, that is kept and guarded for us until the day in which he comes in his glory. So we're needing that constant looking back and looking forward. Why? Why is that so important for us as a people of God to need from our elders? It's very simple. We forget. We, we forget. Uh, we, we stray. Um, uh, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Um, and even as Isaiah was saying, that, that we just choose our own way. So we need that reminder to, we, to see the bigness of the cross. Oftentimes we try to we diminish the cross. We think less of it. Um, and by doing and what I mean by that is when we exalt ourselves and when we think of our own rightness or, or, or our own righteousness, it's as if we're trying to add to the cross. We're trying to add to Jesus' sufferings that it was insufficient. So let me do more to earn good favor in the sight of God, to, to, to be more reconciled to the Father. So let me now do all these things so that I'll receive some award. And what again, what we're doing, and when we do that, we're forgetting the cross. We're, we are forgetting um, what was secured, what was fulfilled, the, the completeness of what happened on that day. We also forget about the future glory. We begin to look around and we start to glory in the things of this world. We start to glory in our own reputations and our finances and our own security, our own comfort, all the other things, right? We begin to hope in the glory of the world. And again, what Peter is doing and what we need our elders to be doing is to, to, lift, to be lifting our gaze above the, the hope that's the false hope that's offered in this world and instead fix it upon the future hope of the glory that is to come, looking back, looking forward, all within a in a position of humility. Now, that's the basis. That's the first part. Now we move into the second part. How is this expressed? And here Peter goes super practical, really down on on the um, uh, on the basic level, and we see it in verse two. He says very simply now that he's established what he's going to say. He says verse two, elders, you need to do this, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. Shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight. That's it. Uh, how we do it comes up a little bit later, but that's really the exhortation, to shepherd the flock of God. Notice that it's God's flock. It's not mine. It's not Ken's. It's the, it's, it's the flock of God, exercising oversight. 
meaning, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in just just a couple seconds, but this, this really has uh, alongside it a sense of responsibility, uh, of leading, of protecting, of guarding, uh, of feeding, all this is, is, is this sense of responsibility and exercising oversight. Now, just briefly, this, this metaphor of sheep and shepherds. I don't know if you happened to watch the video I sent it on Friday, but just that beautiful picture of the shepherd calling his, calling his sheep. We see throughout Old Testament and here in the New, we see this metaphor of God's people being referred to as sheep and God's elders, his leaders, referred to as shepherds with himself being the chief shepherd. Um, I don't know if you've ever spent a whole lot of time around sheep, but it is such the perfect metaphor. Um, one of Janae's brothers was a shepherd in Montana for a while, and I texted him earlier this week, and I said, hey man, uh, the passage for this Sunday is all about shepherds and sheep. Do you have any stories uh, that I could use to illustrate a little bit more of this? And he, <laughs> he wrote back, uh, so, I think there's like four or five O's, so many sheep stories. And he goes on to describe two, and I'll just relate to the, re relay them to you uh, briefly. One, um, on this big pasture that he had, this, his flock, there was at the edge of it a, about a 12-foot drop-off, um, like a small cliff. And he had, there was a ewe, a, a baby sheep, that wasn't paying attention and just walked right up to the cliff and then just broop, dropped down. And then he, he stood there and he looked and it, it was living. Um, but he then turned and saw one right after another, one sheep just right after another, just walking to the edge of the cliff <laughs> and walking. I don't know. Am I allowed to chuckle at that? Um, As the resident veterinarian, I don't know if I... I mean, it's sad. It's sad. It's but sad. But just the idea... The, yeah, they... They, and they would just kind of fall on their backs and crack their, crack their heads and just kind of get, get dazed. And, and Chad, her brother's watching this, just sort of shocked by they're just willingly going. They're seeing what's happening and then just off they go. And again, what a perfect illustration for the human condition, right? I mean, how many of us have knowingly um, seen what the result will be of taking a particular action that's not good, and we just go ahead and do it um, for whatever reason. And all of a sudden, we're at the bottom of this this cliff. The other story he mentioned, and this is the one that, that just struck me so much, is um, as a shepherd, he had to continually keep his flock moving uh, to fresh grass. And he sort of would start in the middle of, of a pasture and sort of kind of go outward as a spiral. Because if he stayed in one spot, what the sheep would do is eat all the grass or whatever it was that they were eating. And then, but they wouldn't stop. They would then just continue eating dirt, thinking that that was what they were needing or what they were, I mean, just think about that. Just, they were, they thought what they were consuming was good for them. But in reality, it was dirt. It was harmful, and they could even die from it. And again, how many of us consume things, media, entertainment, uh, whatever it is that we're consuming, thinking it's good for us, but it's actually dirt, or knowing that it's bad for us, kind of like the cliff, and yet we still do it anyway. So many other stories. Um, but the, that, that Chad could have mentioned, but I think we, we get the gist that this is definitely an appropriate metaphor for God, for humanity and especially for God's people. It's the shepherd's responsibility to make sure the flock is well nourished, is protected, looked after, guided, and cared for. It is our calling. It is our responsibility. Just picture yourself for a second as a shepherd. You're standing in this field with a flock of sheep. What are some of the things you're going to be doing to make sure they stay safe? You're going to be looking around. Where are the possible threats, the dangers? Are there wolves among us? Are they being well fed? Are they being well nourished? Are, are they moving around as they ought? Are they staying together? I mean, all these things... It, it is such it is such an appropriate illustration for um, for a shepherd exercising oversight 
Should we get out and drive in these conditions as we go to church? Again, as the shepherd here, I'm saying, you know what? Perhaps it would be best for the flock to stay in our just our personal pens this morning. I don't want to go too far with this, but again, this is just an example of it's it's a hard decision, and, and yet I'm 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 trying to uh, exercise oversight and care for the flock even this morning. Um, I want to say that this also, um, as part of a, of, a, of a shepherd's job, is to, I just am so struck by that eating dirt when you're thinking you're actually eating something that's nourish, nourishing. And at times, a shepherd is called to do that hard business, that hard work of, of correcting. Uh, again, if you saw that video, there were some, some sheep that did not stay with the flock but strayed. And there is that, that calling on the shepherd to go, and Jesus speaks of this also as well, right? To, to bring back that lost sheep, to bring, to bring them back into the fold. And at times that can even come in the form of correction, of saying, listen, you're eating dirt. What you're consuming, what you're doing right now is not healthy, is not helpful to you or anyone else. And that's, that's, a, hard, that's a harder conversation of sure, sure, but that's still... Uh, the calling of the shepherd to at times do that to make sure that the flock is being well nourished. It is possible, it is likely, that Peter had Ezekiel 34 in the back of his mind as he's writing this. And I would, if you have five minutes at some point today, just to flip back to Ezekiel 34 and listen to what the Lord has to say to the elders, to the shepherds of Israel at that time. They were abandoning their posts, and um, and and they're being called uh, to. Um, uh, sorry, um, Janae, are we still alive? My my phone's blowing up, and I'm wondering if that's people saying it's not working. But it's still good. Sorry, being distracting here. But um, Ezekiel 34, please, just a couple minutes, read that. It's as if the, the elders, the shepherds had abandoned their posts. And, and the Lord says through Ezekiel that the shepherds were not feeding the sheep. They were just feeding themselves. And that, again, is something that we need to be cognizant of as shepherds. All is well. All is well. Cool. I think a New Testament um, um, parallel of this would be in Matthew 9. Um, Matthew writes this, and he's speaking of Jesus. Jesus saw the crowds. Perhaps you know this passage. He saw the crowds. He had compassion for them. His heart went out to them because they were harassed and helpless. Like what? Like a sheep without, a sh like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw the crowds, had compassion for them. They were harassed. They were helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. We see that in Ezekiel thirty-four. Jesus uh, saw it during his own ministry. We use the term, I've used the term several times, spiritual orphans, that when we are born, we are born as spiritual orphans outside the family of God. And I think this is another way to say that same thing. Sheep without a shepherd, a spiritual orphan, all needing to be brought in, being adopted as, as a child of God, brought into the fold, brought into the flock of God. It's something that the shepherd does, brings us in. Um, it's not something that we just willingly do. Uh, it's, it's, it is something that we are brought in uh, through a change at, our, in our, at the heart level. Now, that was, that was, again, a lot. That's the exhortation. And again, you, you can see what your needs are. And this is myself included. I need shepherds in my, in my own life. So we, we need uh, shepherds that exercise oversight over us. And it's not as we'll see, to be done in a domineering way. Um, but it is, it, is, uh, it is a calling, and it is ultimately for our own spiritual good, our own health. So practically here, the expression of this, he goes on in verses 2 and 3. Peter says that shepherds are to serve willingly, okay, not under compulsion or some sort of sense of obligation or some sort of drudgery, like telling your kids to clean their rooms, right? You don't want your shepherds kind of moaning and groaning, okay, I guess we'll do worship today, right? That doesn't do anyone any good, right? So uh, first of all, the shepherds should be doing so willingly, not under compulsion, that this is something uh, that, one, that one is doing willingly. Certainly you guys wouldn't, 
<laughs> I'm just playing through scenarios in my mind of just, you know, okay, well, let's sing a song. You know, now I will say, totally being honest here, I can't stand doing expense reports. That's drudgery to me. Um, but that's part of still the calling. So let's not be so... Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm just being transparent here. There, there are some aspects of uh, all of our work, right? That, that is not the most um, life-giving. And doing expense reports is that thing that just drains me. <laughs> it drains me. But stuff like this uh, and shepherding in, in that sense uh, certainly uh, is, is life-giving. Kind of going into the next thing. The shepherds are to serve eagerly. This is something that... You know, it is actually underneath that word is, is more of a, a purity nuance that it, it's it's um, a, a strong desire and a pure motive, I think, is another way to understand this term eagerly because he contrasts it with shameful gain. So in other words, a pastor, you do not need a pastor, a, a shepherd, an elder who is in it for the prestige, who is in it for the wealth um, the, the glamour, um, that is, that is, that is, that's not the calling. Um, and I'm sure we've got stories, uh, you know, big or small, and this is something, you know, uh, we all need to be cognizant of, and you all need to hold me accountable to. Um, I joke sometimes, and I did this early on, so maybe I'll remember it, of, of like, when we were moving into Livingstones, making the comment, well, where's the statue of me going to be? You know, and um, I'm doing that as a joke, but I'm also just doing that really to remind myself that this is this is the flock of God. This is not mine, um, and to um, <laughs> to not be in it for shameful gain. All right, let's move on to the third one. So willingly, eagerly, and then lastly, as an example, you need you need elders, you need leaders who are uh, setting an example, not being domineering. Um, this does not mean, like I was saying earlier, this does not mean that we are not to correct and, and bring back into the fold or discipline even as, 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 because at times we're called to that. But it's to be done from a position of humility um, and, and in even serving as examples ourselves. How many things, uh, like, um, I don't, want you to, I don't want to reuse the word example, but how many experiences from our own lives do we have where we observe the the actions of others and it's and it and it just so much more speaks to us than merely what they're saying especially if what they're saying is done in a domineering tone watching other people and the examples and the lives that they live is so much more powerful and certainly the elders of the church are called uh, to that very thing um, not being a domineering authoritative in like this um, vindictive way but in, in a way of, of humility and um, living a life with their lives as examples. Um, we need elders who are chief repenters. I, I remember being told that when I, I became a ruling elder about 10 years ago, 11, 10 years ago, yeah, doesn't matter. And um, that's someone, what someone told me, that an elder is to be a chief repenter of the body. Uh, the first one to to uh, confess, um, the first to sacrifice for the flock, to be vulnerable, um, and, and and acknowledging the brokenness again, looking back to the cross, looking forward to the the hope of glory. Now, that is the the basis of what Peter is saying. We've talked about how it's expressed, and now what is the power underneath it? What's the motivation? What is that other element to this that? Um, just kind of captures captures us. And I think it's most clearly seen in this fact. Very simply, we need to remember who Peter is. Um, remember, We need to remember his story. This is Peter, okay? So meaning, this is Peter who fell asleep in the garden when Jesus is praying. This is Peter who um, denied Jesus after taking an oath that he wouldn't do that, but three times denying ever knowing Jesus. Uh, as I read this week by, by someone, um, beyond doubt, this writer says, beyond doubt, Peter's actions should have disqualified him for ch from church leadership. Um, 
yet here he is, an apostle, an elder, a shepherd, and an overseer, right? We see the denial, but Jesus doesn't leave him there. Jesus restores him. He brings him back in. Uh, Jesus reinstates him, questioning him three times to match the three times Peter denied. Jesus is asking him three times, Peter, do you love me? Jesus wasn't mocking him, he, but what he was doing was inviting Peter to declare three times, yes, I love you, Lord, you know I love you. And then three times, Peter says, Jesus says to Peter, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, and then lastly, Jesus says very clearly to Peter, Peter, feed my sheep. This letter that we've been going through these past couple months is Peter's expression of feeding the sheep, doing that thing that Jesus called him to do. The fact that Peter was an elder had nothing to do with Peter, had everything to do with Jesus. So just as a, as a comment, there's nothing innate within me or Ken or whomever else Jesus calls to be an elder at Grace Hill. There's nothing within us uh, that makes us worthy of being an elder, deserving of it, that this is something that we have. No, no, it's all him. We, and, and we're seeing Peter as this, this wonderful example of, of, the, of the work that Jesus did in his own life and is doing within our lives. But really, let's look uh, at verse 4. Let me just see the, conclude with this. And when the chief shepherd, again, Jesus, the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Peter is not saying that elders are going to get any sort of special recognition or designation or anything like that apart from the rest of the flock. The, the crown is a metaphor. The glory is the reality. And this is something that is true for all of us. None of us deserve to be in the flock of God. None of us deserve it. It's all him bringing us in. And I want to conclude in John 10, Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have, I'm going to continue with this. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. So Gentiles, those who are outside of Israel, I have sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. And for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it back up again. Jesus laid down his life and by the power of the spirit took it back up again. And by that same spirit, we are united with him and have been raised with him to new life, a new life of restoration, looking forward to that day when we do come into glory, uh, receiving that metaphorical crown of glory, but that reality of glory, of being in completely restored, redeemed bodies. That is our hope, and we need elders pointing us to the cross, pointing us forward. And it, just as a final comment, now you know how to pray for your elders. <laughs> Now you know how to pray for me, pray for Ken. And I would just ask, as I am already praying this, I would ask that you, uh, as, the, as the flock of Grace Hill, be praying for um, other elders to, to rise up from our midst uh, to lead us to shepherd this flock. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for being the chief shepherd. Thank you for the fact that um, my failings, um, though they are many, uh, do not prevent me um, from leading this flock. And I, I just, I, I thank you for that. I thank you for the, the calling I have, as well as Ken, um, the, an, an enormous privilege it is to be your under shepherds here at Grace Hill. I pray that you uh, do lead us as our shepherd in the way we um, check to see if prompt proper nourishment is there, uh, that as we feed on the word, it's not dirt, but it's, it is life-giving nourishment. Um, help us to see the dangers that exist. Uh, yes, false doctrine, but also division and, and all kind of other manner of things that can threaten the flock. 
I pray for courage um, uh, to, to lead uh, and do so with humility. Receive all the glory. We pray this in your name. Amen. As a response to what we just heard, uh, I thought it would be appropriate if we all read Psalm 23 together. And so um, it's in the bulletin, and I'm going to, I've asked uh, my girls to lead us in the reading of Psalm 23. You guys ready? All right. So let's, let's read Psalm 23 together. Please join us in saying the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's now stand and sing this final song together.
so uh, again, um, thank you all for worshiping uh, and being flexible uh, with us this morning. Uh, I appreciate it. And again, I'm secure enough in my skin. Bring the North Carolina jokes. Keep them coming. Um, it's fine. <laughs> Um, it's okay. Um, so uh, receive now this, this benediction from Hebrews 13. Uh, may it comfort you um, as you uh, proceed with this Sabbath day and, and into the week to come. Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought you again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. And to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing now the doxology. Praise God.